Well, hello, everybody. Hello. 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 We have a lot of people out today. Uh, very exciting. Um, but we'll get started. Um, just wanted to start off uh, by introducing myself. My name is Jonathan Wilson. I am the manager of digital marketing here at Fine Law. Um, see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Um, but for those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, just to go a quick background, uh, I moved here 18 months ago uh, from Burlington, Vermont. I had previously worked at dealer.com, uh, which was a company that had very similar challenges to what we do here. Uh, they were focused on building scalable online solutions. Uh, they were in the automotive vertical, uh, but really a lot of the same challenges that we face here, having huge portfolios, right? Thousands of websites that we need to maintain and build and upkeep. Uh, we also did there. Uh, prior to that, I worked at a smaller agency. Uh, we had some blue chip clients like Gatorade and the Audubon Guides, uh, where I functioned as an account manager and also graphic designer. So a pretty decent overview um, of how uh, the industry works. Um, and I wanna share a lot of those insights today. So the goal of this presentation is to pull the curtain back on search engines and in the process answer a few questions like why does Google have so many updates uh, how does a search engine work? Uh, what can we expect to see in the future of search? But before we get into answering these questions, first we're just going to start with a story. So imagine you're in a brand new city, right? You've never been there before. You're just checking it out. You really want to understand what the area is like. So one really effective way to be able to do that is just walking around and just checking things out, right? Not necessarily having any prerogative, but just wanting to get a better understanding of the situation. So do we have any folks here who've been to Austin, Texas before? Great, we've got a couple people. Um, anyone here who really likes barbecue? The food? Yeah? Okay, significantly more uh, people enjoy barbecue as well. Um, so as you're walking around, you know, just checking out the city, you know, you walk by one uh, restaurant. You see this place on your right, Franklin's Barbecue. There's a lot of people standing outside. They're saying really great things about the restaurant. Oh my gosh, this line's so long, but it's totally worth it. Looks great. So, you know, you're not necessarily there to eat food. You're just checking out the city. But, you know, maybe you'll investigate a little bit further. So you walk by a little table. You look at the food, and it looks really, really awesome, right? Uh, delectable. It smells really good. Again, you're hearing people eating it, saying how much they enjoy it. And so you're like, okay, cool. You know, I'm not too hungry. I'm just checking out the city. I'll just keep on walking, you know, see what else is around here. And so you pass this other place on your left. You can't really see what the name is. You're not sure if it's Igs B Barbecue or Bigs Barbecue or some kind of confusing permutation thereof. There's no one really outside. It's a little dead. Uh, you peek in the window and you see, well, <laughs> it's not as good looking as Franklin's Barbecue, right? But again, your agenda isn't to eat food. You're just checking out the city, just, just walking around. So as you're walking, you're kind of storing these things in your brain, right? You're thinking Franklin's barbecue, great looking barbecue, big lines, you know, people saying great things about it. And then Igsby, Biggs Barbecue, you're still not really sure, assuming maybe it's Biggs Barbecue, but you know, it's got kind of that nasty looking food over there. Um, but you know, regardless, you just keep on walking, right? You're checking out the city, the temperature, comparing it to what you know about Minneapolis and saying what you like or what you might not like about the city as well. But then all of a sudden, you run into Michael Mathias. So you're, <laughs> you're a little nervous, you know, maybe a little bit of armpit sweat going on. You're like, I can't, can't mess this one up. And he asks you, hey, you know, where's a killer local place that we can get some barbecue? So you start thinking about all the stuff you just saw, right? all that information that you had stored about those two restaurants, you know, the, the wait time, uh, what the quality of the food looks like, uh, things you heard people saying about it. And so in your head, you're making this decision. And then finally, you know, you can give them the answer. So how many people here would vote for that first place we saw, which was Franklin's Barbecue, the one with the big line? Right. So pretty unanimous. Most folks would go that. Anyone for Igsby or Biggs, Biggs Barbecue? No? No takers? Okay. I would say the same thing, so don't worry, you guys all made the right answer. Good job, you've been doing well at Learning Week thus far. But if we just break down what we just saw, right? What we did at first, we walked around, we used our senses to understand you know, the world around us, right? We stored that stuff into our brain, we got our question that got asked to us, we thought about you know, what 
we had just seen, kind of based on these observations, and then finally we respond with an answer, right? Franklin's barbecue, you should probably go there. And so the main takeaway from this presentation is that search engines are just like us, uh, to use the Us Weekly reference. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking about that in more detail here. And so that first stage that we were at, when we were just walking around, observing things, search engines do the same thing, it's just called crawling. And so, you know, we walk around as humans, we can walk forward, left, right, you know, wherever we want, we can moonwalk if possible, if you have the skills. Um, but that's how we, we move around the city. So search engines are pretty similar as well. They employ web spiders, but the way that they move is just from link to link to link. Um, and when I say link, I mean literally it's underlined text that you can just click on any website, brings you to another website. That's how search engines move around. So they're not as autonomous as we are as humans, but they can move from place to place to place. And that's how they crawl the internet. Similarly, we were using our senses, right? We're looking at the food, we're hearing people's voices, uh, we're smelling the food, uh, probably not touching random people's food, but you know, that's a, that's a possibility as well. Um, and that's how we understand the phenomenon of the world around us, right? Search engines are a little bit different because they don't have all those capabilities that we do have, but they are able to understand text. Um, and so this is how a search engine kind of consumes the world, right? Just looking at text, understanding what it is, and then storing it in the thing. But there's limits to perception, uh, especially to our own human perception. So if you guys were to come across, you know, some food that was in a container, what types of things you, would you do, other than lifting the top, to figure out what's actually inside that container? Smell it, yeah, exactly. You would smell, you'd probably be able to figure out what it is. Touch it, yeah, you could touch it, lift it in the same way, kind of use your tactile senses to kind of understand what's there. And so those are both really great because they're showing that we're using the existing senses that we have because we can't see through metal, right? We don't have x-ray vision. Um, in the same way, search engines are gonna have limits to their own perception. So this is the internet, uh, AKA a cat video, uh, which is about 90%. Um, but search engines can't see that, right? Uh, because they really can only understand text. They can't watch a video like we can and understand, okay, this is a cute cat video and it's wrapped in a, I don't know, paper towel or something like that. Um, and so we're able to provide other cues for the search engine knowing that they can only consume text. And so this is the bottom part of that YouTube video, for instance. And so we have different elements that are sending cues, like how we as humans you know, would touch, we would smell, maybe ask other people you know, what's in there. Um, in the same way we can provide those cues so that search engines can understand what that video is about, right? So we have funny cat, funny cat videos ever, uh, you know, funny cat video compilation, uh, funny cats, cats video, et cetera, right? So if you were just reading the text, it would be pretty telling that this is probably a video about cats, probably pretty funny. You see that 41 million people have watched this video. So it's also pretty popular and probably pretty good as well. And so when the search engine sees you know, this previous, right? Um, it's seeing the same content here, just in the text, right? Funny cat videos, funny cat videos, uh, funny cat videos, and then funny cat videos. And so again, the search engine is reading the code so that they can really understand what the content is of that video that they can't actually see. So the takeaways from this crawling section, right, is that search engine perceive using bots. Uh, those bots are sometimes called spiders, web crawlers, web spiders. And those bots have limitations in what they're able to consume beyond just simply text. And through good coding, good SEO practices, that we can help overcome those limitations. We can send certain cues to let the search engine know what a page is actually about. So we've walked through crawling, which is kind of observing the phenomena around you. The next part is the index, right? How we as human put that stuff into our brain and draw certain associations, right? We would take Big Z with the burnt food and then Franklin's barbecue with that really good looking food in the long line. Well, search engines, or excuse me, the human brain is also pretty significant too. Um, the size is about 2.5 petabytes. So a petabyte is 1 million gigabytes. And so think about those little one million, or excuse me, those little uh, gigabyte drives that we have. That's 2.5 million of those. That's the equivalent of your brain. And our brain does more than just memorize stuff, right? It functions, makes our lungs work, uh, helps us breathe, helps us walk around. There's a lot of other functions that are done. 
So Google's index is significantly larger. It's about the size of 19 brains or 100 petabytes. Uh, it's pretty significant because it's only focus on collecting information. It doesn't need to you know, make its lungs work or anything like that. So we know that the index is really, really, really big. But next, let's go through you know, what's actually inside. So as humans, you know, we looked at the restaurant, the on-site content was you know, the food that they actually serve. Uh, for search engines, on-site content is the content that's actually on a website, right? The search engine wants to know, um, you know, what are you talking about? Are you pointing people to menus or photos or merchandise? What other elements are on that website? And so they want to answer those questions, right? What is the website? Who's the website made by? Uh, where is the website made? Is it here domestic in the United States? Or is it local to Austin, Texas? Or is it some, in the third world, right? Or is it from Russia? Um, when was it built? Is it a fly-by-night website that just got built yesterday? Or is it something that's been around for 15, 20 years and really showing that longevity there? Why does this website exist? Does it help users answer a question? Does it help deliver knowledge to people? Or is it there just to make people sign up for you know, shady credit card and then you know, fraud ensues, right? Um, and then finally, how's that website built? Is it using text? Is it using other signifiers to let us understand what the website is actually about? We're also gonna be looking at offsite uh, elements that are stored in the index. So if you remember the offsite elements, those are those people kind of standing around saying good things, bad things about your restaurant. Or in the case of Bigsby, you know, no one's really standing outside of there at all. And so if we knew more about the people that were standing outside, uh, we'd get a better understanding about whether that's a good line, those are good endorsements, or if they're bad. So if we have you know, some tourists, we have some five-star chefs, Emerald Gossi is outside, Anthony Bourdain is there you know, talking up with a film crew, those are gonna be really, really strong, powerful endorsements, right? Because we all trust those people. Also, if there's a bunch of locals who understand that it's worth standing outside there for a couple hours, you know, that's gonna be good. Yeah, there might be a couple people who are paid to stand outside, that's okay. It's only two or three. You know, we still understand that it's a quality restaurant. And so those endorsements are really equal to links. Um, an endorsement is just saying, yes, I believe, I support, you know, this business. Building a link to a certain website is gonna function in that same way. And so if we take uh, some of the links that are pointing to Franklin's Barbecue, they're really high value, right? They're like those five-star chefs. Wall Street Journal, you know, venerable publication. It's been around pre-digital era um, for a number of years. If they're supporting Franklin's Barbecue under the title Austin's Best New Barbecue Destination, that's a pretty good endorsement, right? Same thing here, Washington Post, uh, some great places that we can eat. We see Franklin's Barbecue on the end there as well, right? Those are really strong, good, powerful endorsements on a national scale. But we can also get local endorsements as well. So Culture Map Austin, uh, Lonely Planet Guides, um, Austin Eavesdropper, and the Austin Not for Tourist Guides. Those are all local links reinforcing that Franklin's Barbecue is a really strong, good place to go eat food. And the search engine can pick up on that. So in contrast, if we took IGSB Biggs Barbecue and looked at some of the, the links that are there, they don't really make as much sense, right? They're not relevant. Um, for instance, the James Bond Museum, which is located in Sweden, is linking to Biggs Barbecue. Does this make sense to anyone just intuitively, right? You know, probably not. What does James Bond in a different country have to do with you know, this barbecue place? Same thing, you know, Mystic Lake Casino and Hotel casino in Minnesota, why are they linking to Austin? This doesn't really make sense, right? It's not as strong of an endorsement as those relevant links that we were looking at at our other website. Same thing, Japan products, high quality products and services, different country, and then this kind of new agey, agelessskincare.com. Again, probably doesn't make any sense linking to what we saw as, you know, pretty shoddy looking barbecue spot. And so, when the search engine is storing link information, we're kind of following that same thing that they're doing with the on-site information, right? What's the link? Who's the link coming from? Where's the link located? Is it in Japan or Sweden? Or is it you know, local in Austin? Um, you know, when was the link built? Were they all built in one day? That doesn't really seem very kind of natural. Or were they built over time? As more people caught wind of the business. Uh, why does the link exist? Uh, is it there to point users to where a great barbecue place is, or is it just arbitrarily there on a giant list of things? And then finally, how was that link built, right? Was it built through a 
kind of spammy link building campaign, or was it built you know, relatively easy? All these signals will help the search engines understand, okay, these links are really valuable, and li these links are not that valuable. Um, as a side note here, sometimes you know, we talk about paid links, and we talk about them in a really negative way. Not all paid links are bad. Um, for instance, New York Times, you can buy links from the New York Times. They cost $200,000, but you can buy them. Uh, New York Times, $150,000. BuzzFeed, $100,000. Time Magazine, $200,000. So even these well-known, respected sources, you can still buy links from there. It's just that it's really, really, really expensive. The problem is when you start buying links uh, that are not really that valuable, not related to your business, and they're really, really cheap, and search engines generally do not like that. There's other things in the data as well. A lot of personal information. Uh, so some people uh, start to think Skynet, Terminator 2, kind of dystopian future. But even for myself, the information that they're looking at right, is my search history. So late night as I'm looking for sneakers so that I can do my little GCC walking uh, activities, uh, you know, they know all the different things that I'm searching there. Uh, with your cell phone, they understand you know, where you are, what directions you're punching in, so not even where you are. But in addition to that, where you want to go, generally, um, your email, indexing your email, understanding who you're talking to, what you're talking about. And that's why sometimes you'll see those ads at the top of Gmail uh, that are really relevant to a conversation that you have. It's because they're indexing that information about you. And really, any of those Google apps, they're collecting all that information. It's kind of scary stuff. Um, so if anyone wants to kind of opt out of that, you could actually download uh, your history and delete it if you don't want them to have you know, five, six years uh, worth, worth of all your search history, both at work and at home. Um, and we'll send this deck afterwards, and so there'll be a lot of kind of like nerd alert, paranoid big brother <laughs> little things at the bottom. And so if you want to click through to any of those, uh, feel free. And if you have any questions, obviously, uh, we'll talk about them at the end. Um, Google also uh, reignited their partnership with Twitter uh, about a month and a half ago. So even your tweets are indexed, right? So think about the picture that they have of you now, right? Not only of, of the website and the on-site and the off-site content, but also of you as the user, you know, where you're going, who you're talking to, what you're talking about, what you're searching through. The Chrome browser, same thing, literally knows every single website that you go to. Um, that's a lot of information on a user. So yeah, if you're scared, I'd recommend doing that. Um, but some of the key takeaways you know, from that index is that crawled information is stored in the index, right? What's the, what the search engine is able to see. That's the equivalent of their brain. Uh, the index is huge, right? It's about 19 brains all put together, just focused on giving you answers to those queries of you know, who Taylor Swift is dating or cat videos or whatever. Um, and it stores on-site, off-site information. It's all, also information about the user. So we talk through observing things, storing it into our brain. The next part is when we get that question, which we just call a query. And that's what you search into the Google, or you might talk into it as well. And so you'll get a question like, where's a killer local place that we can get some barbecue? So to us as humans, it's really, really easy to consume this question and understand it, right? But if we break down the little pieces, we can see that it's actually a pretty complex query uh, that Michael asked us, but we're all you know, able to think through what that means. So where's? So that shows intention of a location. You know, where is something? If you were to respond with blue, that would probably be a bad answer, right? People want an address. Uh, killer. So literally, killer means to, you know, murder someone. Uh, <laughs> that's not what we're asking to do. Uh, he's not asking us to, you know, murder someone. Uh, but we know that killer is a synonym for good, right? It's slang. It's colloquial, how people are actually talking. Um, local place. That's going to be relevant based on the user, right? You guys are both on foot, talking to each other in Austin, Texas. So local probably means within you know, a one mile radius. If you guys were in a helicopter, way up top above Austin, Texas, local might be you know, 15 mile radius. And so it can kind of change based upon where you are, your mode of transportation. But again, we can process that as humans really, really, really fast. Can get, so that's showing some intention, right? You wanna buy something, purchase something, engage with something. And then finally, BBQ, which we all know, again, is a synonym that just means barbecue. So this really similar or simple question right here actually is really, really complex, right? So you don't have to read this, but if we were you know, data from Star Trek or something like this, this might be how we might frame that question. Um, in addition to understanding what the words someone's using, also you want to understand the user. 
so even when we were you know, giving a response, uh, most of us, or all of us, voted for Franklin's barbecue, there were some, um, some assumptions that we already had, right? Michael Mathias is an omnivore. He likes things that taste good. Uh, he's on foot with you, probably doesn't care too much about the line. And so Franklin's barbecue would be an awesome response and a great answer. But if we had Bizarro, Michael Mathias, um, you know, he prefers his food burnt. He hates crowds and lines, and he's in a huge, huge rush. We might actually say, okay, yeah, you know, Iggs B, Biggs Barbecue, that might be the, you know, the spot for you, kind of depending on, on your own needs. And so good search engines are going to be able to do that same thing, right? As they collect information about us, they, they'll know what types of results we would want to see. And so that whole thought process is called semantic search. But essentially all it is is understanding the intent of a user. So when someone says, you know, where's a killer local place to get some barbecue, understanding that intent. But then also understanding the context of the user, you know, where they are, what other information do we know about them, and then providing a response there. So we've talked through storing the information, or observing the information, storing it, getting a question asked to us. Next part is the algorithm. So that's us as humans as we kind of think through the pros and cons of different responses and we give that response to someone. And so search engine algorithms work pretty similarly. It's really the secret sauce that holds them together. But algorithms aren't just those big three search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo. There's search engines everywhere. You know, Amazon, for instance, they're taking into account past searches and past purchases that you have made. They'll also take into account purchases that other people like you have made. And so they'll couple certain products together. They know if you're reading uh, the first Twilight book, you're probably going to want the second Twilight book, and so on and so forth. Um, Google, YouTube, those are pretty self-explanatory. Wolfram Alpha uh, prefers like really structured content, the type of stuff that you would see um, in an Excel doc. And that's what drives a lot of Apple series answers. Um, they're all pulling from Wolfram Alpha. Bing, you know, pretty similar to Google insofar that they're looking at content. They're also looking at links, um, but then even searching, you know, in your email and Outlook, right? That's a search engine as well. They're indexing all the different emails you have, so you can put from X, Y, Z, and then you'll get all the emails that's from that person, and then Yellow Pages as well. And so what I wanted to do was kind of show uh, how a search engine works using a pretty primitive search engine, uh, which is the hub. So, so the hub, this is the mood elevator uh, that we'll be talking about through this whole week. Um, so how many people are up here, generally, when they're using the hub, searching for things? <laughs> no? No? Not even a sarcastic hand raise. Wow. Um, and how many people are down here? You know, maybe frustrated, a little irritated, when you really want to look at something? Yeah, right, it's a pretty frustrating experience sometimes. Well, let's figure out why it's so frustrating, right? So what I did as a little test uh, is I Googled Find My Leadership. Um, I was specifically looking for the photograph of Michael Mathias to use here, and so I thought maybe I could find it on the hub. I couldn't. Um, <laughs> but, but, but if we look, um, you know, the results aren't that bad, right? We have Amy Sawyer, uh, Drew Swain uh, in the bottom. So people who actually do, you know, write for the leadership do show up, and so, you know, they're pretty good results. I just wasn't able to find, you know, specifically what I was able to work for. Well, I was like, okay. I want to hack this thing. I want to see if I can get you know, to the top. So I did a little research. I found that the hub is on a platform by Jive Software. So then I went to the Jive Software website, uh, looked at how the hub uh, ranks different pieces of content, what you can do to move up, and then looked at a couple of forums and had a very thrilling Tuesday uh, at home uh, doing that. And I found that, um, well, I won't tell you yet. And so what I did is uh, you know, I built out this page called Fine Law Leadership. And everywhere where there's an arrow is I just put the word Fine Law Leadership, right? So it's in the title, it's in the tags, I even put a misspelling there, and then it's throughout the text, right? So it's like mildly coherent, but not really. I'm just spamming Fine Law Leadership over and over and over and over again. <laughs> what happens? Number one. <laughs> and, that, and that was within like an hour and a half, super, super, super quick. And so, the, so that's one of the takeaways as well, is that uh, you can spam hub, but please don't do that. It's going to make it horrible for everyone. <laughs> don't do that. Um, but we also see there's replies, likes, and views. Those were all really low. And so the hub isn't taking into you know, account any engagement or how people are enjoying you know, certain posts or if they liked it. That's not being taken into account. It's really just, are you spamming? Yes, no, yes, you're number one. Um, 
And so obviously this provides really bad user experience. So imagine if we were in a situation where it was worth $50 million to be number one on the hub. What would happen is we would all spam it like crazy, right? You would get these huge blocks of text that would just be the same word over and over and over and over again. And that's what we see with search engines, right? Um, little black address, for instance, uh, around you know, Black Friday time. That's a multi-million dollar term. And if you're able to rank just by spamming it, there's gonna be horrible results, right? And that's gonna be very, very sad for people to say a panda. <laughs> um, and beyond just users having a bad experience, right, and not wanting to come back, more importantly is the money factor. If people are not coming back to search engines, whether it's Google, Bing, Yahoo, whatever, they're not making money. People are not clicking on ads. So always, you know, when you hear people talking about put the user first, it's really put the money first. It's just the only way to get to the money is via users, right? That's why users really need to be primary when we're building out websites because that's what's going to provide a great experience. People are gonna come back to Google and continue using it like they do now. And so Google made some updates continuing the panda theme. This is a happy panda, he's chilling. He has his little panda fat right there, which looks really comfortable like a pillow. Um, but so Google made updates uh, to prevent keyword spamming. So what I did on the hub to avoid things like that. So now websites that have really good quality relevant content that users find really, really useful and really, really engage with, that's what that panda update is about. And it's a rolling update and it continues to occur and it will continue to occur. Um, I think there should be a new update according to SMX within the next two months, uh, focused again on making sure that really good content goes to the top. And if you recall when we were talking about you know, endorsements, right, offline endorsements, and how some you know, might be good if they have a five-star chef, they might not be as good, right, if we found out every single person was just paid to stand in this line, right? People aren't standing there because you know, it's great. It's like, no, I'm just, you know, whatever, I'm getting my 20 bucks for the day and I just stand outside and pretend you know, this is a really popular line. Again, that wouldn't be as valuable if we had you know, our Anthony Bourdain's and all of our local people as well. And so Google introduced the penguin update that was focused on that. Notice that these are penguins linked together. Yeah, <laughs> like that, a little visual thing. Um, and, and the focus there was understanding you know, what are high quality links, what are low quality non-relevant links, and how can we push up websites that have those high quality relevant links and kind of push down those websites which are just buying it or doing it in a scalable situation where it doesn't really, really make sense. Um, at SMX, they also, which was last week um, in Seattle that I was at, um, they also talked through how this Penguin update is soon going to be automated. So they're just going to use machine learning to be able to update uh, Penguin c consistently uh, throughout time so that we're able just to always have that in flux without having a human change in algorithm or do anything, which is pretty exciting as well. We're also seeing local search booming. So uh, within the last four years, uh, people adding near me on a query uh, has increased about 34 times um, over those last few years. And so when we're saying near me, that's a strong signal for local intent, right? It's, you know, you want something physically where you are, not something that's in you know, four or five towns over. And so as a result of that, um, you know, Google introduced the Venice and Pigeon updates. So this is why our local team is really, really on people to make sure that we're claiming good listings that are real and not virtual listings. Because both of these updates are focused on making sure that we're getting really high quality, relevant results for people who are searching for things around them. This is also in Venice with a pigeon, by the way. Um, what we're also seeing is semantic search on the rise. So questions like, you know, where's a killer place we can get barbecue? That's nine words. Um, so it's pretty complex. What we're seeing is a flatlining of one word queries, right? Someone just putting in BBQ, right? And what we're also seeing is a huge decline in those two to four word queries, right? Really, really simple ones. But we're seeing this big increase on five and six, six word uh, or more queries. So what that's showing is that over time, people are becoming more comfortable with search engines and typing in things like how you would normally talk rather than typing in you know, what you would see in a search engine. And so as a result of that, Google introduced the Hummingbird update. So the Hummingbird update was just better at understanding the intent of the user, understanding the context of the user, and then delivering those results faster to people. So when we're making those really complicated, complex queries, that they're able to give us a result really, really quickly. 
Moving on to mobile, uh, what we've seen is in 2014, we reached this kind of inversion point. And so this line right here, this is mobile ownership, and then that line right there, that is desktop ownership. So what we see here is that now more people own cellular phones than they do personal computers. Even within the last month, uh, May 5th, 2015, Google came out and said that in the US as well as a few other um, developed nations that there are more people searching on mobile phones than they are on desktop. So this is huge, right? And that's part of the reason why Google added that mobile update, mobile get in, which the performance team operations and a slew of other people, you know, did a great job getting ahead of. But essentially they were saying, you know, if your website is not mobile friendly, it's gonna get pushed down in those rankings. And again, it's not, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, it's because users are asking questions on their mobile phone. And so they want to get results that are on their mobile phone that doesn't crash it as well. So some takeaways from the algorithm section is the algorithm is just really similar to how we think, right? It's the secret sauce that distinguishes Bing from Yahoo, from Yellow Pages, from the hub, and that the, the really good ones are very user-centric, understanding more about the user and providing those relevant results for the user as well. So we've talked through observing things, putting it into our brain, getting that question asked, and then finally think about it. And this last part is the SERPs, which is search engine result page. So that means after you Google something, when you hit enter, that page that shows up with all the responses, that's the search engine results page. So if we had, you know, Franklin's Barbecue versus Big, uh, if someone asked us, you know, which one's better, and we just, you know, clapped or stomped, it'd be really confusing. You're like, no, I asked you a question. I want you to respond, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a location, uh, not with some weird kind of body movement, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because the response needs to match what the actual question is that the person's asking. And so that's what we're seeing here. So I was Googling audience falling asleep. I felt like I went through, I see some yawns back there. Um, and, and, and so I, I figured that, you know, people would be slightly bored, but it did exactly what I wanted, is that I wanted photographs of audience members falling asleep. So I thought it'd be better to take a photo, uh, screenshot of that, and also relevant articles about people falling asleep as well. If you search for something different, car accident, lawyer near me, Again, you're gonna get different types of results based on that. So that near me, again, means you know, in my vicinity. I was Googling it from Egan, and so that's why we're getting all these responses in Minneapolis, as opposed to getting responses in Austin or you know, somewhere else. Um, also, we have advertisements, ad, 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 ad. So those are all paid. That's why there's a huge focus lately on our PPC and making sure that we're scaling that up for our clients because that's really, really valuable research or uh, real estate is it's all above the fold. And so if people can pay some money to be the top result, it's probably worth it for them. And then down here, we also have our local results as well, which again, you know, that Pigeon uh, Venice updates are focused on that. And then finally, if we look at one of these right here, you'll notice that it says five star stars, 26 Google reviews. And Sean's gonna be talking about some of that stuff in his presentation as well as how this stuff is gleaned from websites. And that's also why we encourage our clients to make sure that they're getting reviews from really, really happy, satisfied clients. That's why we have Gradus on our websites as well um, so that we can draw more kind of positive social signals there as well. Um, going back to Franklin's Barbecue, notice the theme uh, going through, is when we search for Franklin's Barbecue, Look at all the different information that they're giving us, right? Again, it's radically different than what we saw for those first two queries. So we get the actual website. We're getting uh, review information pulled in, address information pulled in, quick links to be able to jump to pre-ordering so that you can go straight to what you really want or the menu. Sometimes it's really frustrating when you're searching for a restaurant and they don't actually have a page on the menu and it's like, that's the whole reason we came here. Relevant news related to Franklin's Barbecue. Um, and then even reviews from different users saying, hey, you know, this is really good, as well as their contact information, um, all pulled from the knowledge graph. Um, even when we ask questions like, where is Franklin's Barbecue? You know, we get our response in the answer box, right? It's in Texas, and it's, that's pulling that information in, you know, straight for us. And so we've talked about, you know, that full process of, you know, observing, um, storing that information, um, getting the question asked, and then thinking about it and giving the response. And so that's kind of current state picture right now. And so what I'd like to do during the last portion of this is talk through some future state stuff or things that are kind of in play right now that haven't gone to full uh, growth yet. So first with that crawling, right, that's observing what's around us. So earlier I had said that search engines can only index 
text, that's not completely true. Um, there are certain search engines uh, that can do other things, like Shazam, for instance. And again, I have the nerd alert if anyone wants to check out exactly how Shazam works. But what Shazam does is, um, is everyone familiar with Shazam, the app? Okay, a couple of people said no. Um, essentially what it is, it's just an app. Uh, you hit the little Shazam button, you put it up to a speaker while a song is playing, and then within about four seconds, it's gonna tell you that you're listening to um, Katy Perry fireworks or you know whatever, whatever a song uh, it is. And they do that by just transcoding those sound waves um, into essentially numbers and just knowing that from this little snippet of numbers, it's equivalent to you know that Katy Perry song, and then it'll give you that response in turn. But that's pretty exciting, right? It's just being able to understand sound so that you could, you know, hear birds, for, you know, in the future potentially, and then it would, you know, respond with this is the type of bird that you're listening to the call. Also, um, Google is starting to get closer and closer to understanding what's actually behind the video. So this was an experiment that they did on Google X, which is their more kind of experimental unit, uh, where they gave this machine uh, 10 million screenshots from YouTube videos. And they asked the machine to kind of come up with, you know, an image, like what is YouTube all about? And if you see in the image, it's a cat. Again. And again, if you want to learn more about, you know, that actual thing, the link's down there as well. There's also an image search functionality. So this isn't part of Google's actual algorithm right now. But if you go to images.google.com, what you can do is you can take an image and you can drop it into um, the search engine, and it'll tell you what that image is, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, anybody watch the show Catfish? No, a couple people? Okay, not, not too many MTV watchers, I guess. Maybe, maybe I'm too old for that demographic. But anyway, uh, Catfish is this great show. Um, essentially what it is is there's people who are online dating who have not actually met each other in real life, and then they have this third party come in to figure out, like, are these people actually who they say they are? Sometimes they are. Sometimes, you know, the 19-year-old girl ends up being like a 55-year-old man. Um, but one of the things that they do is reverse image search. So if you're finding people's profiles, you know, it's good best practice to drop that in. And if there's 400 websites where the same photograph is there, it's probably not a real person. Well, that's another functionality uh, that, that, you know, should eventually be added to Google as well. Um, so the index. So as we move forward into the future, you know, we just want to see a larger and larger and larger index with more and more information. So like that Google partnership um, that I spoke about. But there's also the Internet of Things, stuff that's just connected to the Internet. So for instance, this Google Next, uh, this thing costs 250 bucks. Uh, you use it just by taking out your existing thermostat, put Google Nest in. What it does is it starts to see trends with how you turn up and down temperatures day by day. And it starts using machine learning to understand, um, okay, I know that John comes home every day at 6.30 and he likes it at 72 degrees and it will automatically do that. And it will also switch depending on the season as well. So you no longer have to kind of fiddle with this thing all the time. It just is automatically gonna learn after about a week of you um, doing it manual. And so that's really exciting because that information can be added to the index as well. So beyond even just knowing you know, about an individual, what they're searching for on their computer, you can also understand how they heat the house. Um, you know, this is available in refrigerators as well uh, for changing the temperatures there. Um, even with cars, uh, both Mercedes-Benz and Subaru have added connectivity to some of their future cars coming out in the next two years. Well, they'll have better information about when you get into a car accident. So imagine for us here, uh, we do lawyer marketing. If we were able to integrate with those data feeds so that we know that if someone gets into an accident in a Subaru, instantly they probably want to call a car accident attorney near them, right? And so there's some really, really great, interesting possibilities in the future about how we can integrate into the internet of things beyond just Google Next, right? It's exciting stuff. Uh, the query. So the query is becoming more and more complicated, more about how we actually talk. So the Google Watch uh, just came out. I think Mark Jacobson, I think, has one, and a couple other people I've seen wearing them. But when you're asking questions, right, you're not going to type, you know, with, with fat fingers on this very little thing. You're just going to ask a question like Dick Tracy style. And so when we're asking those questions, we're doing it in, in, a, in a colloquial way, like how we actually talk. And so the outcome is just going to be these longer and longer and longer queries, right? Rather than getting shorter. No one's going to search for cat. You're going to be like, show me the best cat video on the planet, right? And then you'll get cat videos on the go. 
I also grabbed this screenshot. So this is from May 21, 2015. Uh, this is a patent that Google got granted. Um, this is an animatronic little doll. Um, and it has video cameras, microphones in it. And it's made for kids. It's made for really, really, really small toddlers to understand what movements a toddler makes and changing or giving results to them based upon those movements or the sounds that they're, that they're using. So even as we as adults, you know, we can do sophisticated queries, you know, one-year-olds can't. And so that machine is going to be able to understand, you know, the queries that one-year-olds make and then respond accordingly, change the television show, turn up or down the heat or whatever. Again, creepy, right? <laughs> really, really, really creepy. But, and, th and that was like, you know, a month ago. And so, you know, again, as we kind of think through the future of search, um, there's going to be good and bad things. And it's weird for us, but, you know, for younger generations, this is going to become more and more kind of normal, right? You just talk to something, it gives you what you want as soon as you ask for it, right? It's just becoming the new normal, for instance. As we think about the algorithm, really the future is always just going to be focused on the user, right? Any good search engine that wants people to continue coming back is going to be focused on users. So whether they're using you know, mobile phones, making sure that we have mobile results, if there's microchips in our brain, making sure there's microchip brain optimized results, whatever, um, it's always going to be focused on the user, making sure that they're happy and getting really, really good uh, results from there. And finally, it's the search engine results page, right? That's that page when we type something, and then it gives us our response. Is that the future is probably no results page at all. It is by collecting all this information about the Internet of Things, things that you're using, also your mobile phone, your watch, et cetera, really getting a really good portrait of a person, um, we can get a better sense of what stuff someone wants before they even ask for it. So before you even type something into Google, you're going to get these cards. So for instance, um, and this is out right now uh, in, its, in its beta versions, but you know, it can take into account what you listen to on Spotify so that it recommends you know, playlists that's you know, relevant to that. And that's, that's pretty normal, right? Most of us have experience with that. Um, you know, if you're watching episode 1 through 10 of Serial, it's going to recommend episode 11, right? You probably want to see the end of the show. Uh, Franklin's Barbecue, you know, even being at a restaurant, you can beam uh, your check straight to your phone. It'll automatically calculate the tip, and you hit enter. So no longer having to go through that very slow, arduous process, right? You're done eating. you got to wait for someone to bring you a piece of paper. You give them a card. They bring the card back. Then they bring the card to you, and then you sign it, right? Like, why are there five steps there? Why can't they just send it to your phone? And then you just pay it. Um, you know, knowing if you're interested in news, automatically showing you what top stories are going to be the most relevant to you, kind of based upon what type of content that you consume. And then pulling in information from your emails, knowing that if you order something from GNC, uh, you're probably interested in when it's going to arrive. And so then it'll give you an estimate that, you know, the confirmed delivery time is 435, or it'll be delivered in three days, or whatever. So the final takeaway really is that you know, adopting a human framework is a really effective way to talk to our clients about search engines to make it something that's really accessible, right? Rather than getting super nerdy and wonky and talking about queries, you know, just walk people through how they normally make decisions when people ask them things. And through that framework, we can understand both, you know, maybe where this is the hub probably right here. Uh, <laughs> And then maybe Google, you know, is kind of in this zone right here. But then as we go towards the future, right, is that they're just going to be more and more sophisticated and better able to understand uh, exactly what uh, we need to provide to users. And with that, I have a Q&A section. Yeah, I think we have 10, 10 minutes left. Cool. Hi. Oh, she has the microphone. So um, thank you so much for that. That was very um, insightful and entertaining. Sure. My question is, what would you say to clients who do get kind of stuck back in that sort of keyword mode of, well, I want to rank for a certain keyword, so we need to put it everywhere? What mm -hmm. would be your response to that? Well, you can, so there's, I, I guess it depends on the client, but um, one really easy way is to show them on Google's guidelines. It just says don't keyword stuff and don't really use that tactics. And so... That's a pretty authoritative source. If the search engine is saying don't do that, you probably don't want to do it. Um, 
And if they, you know, they might not respond to that as well. And instead what I would do is push them more towards what's the actual business outcome you get, right? If they're ranking number one for term X, that term is not driving money or making the phone ring, then that term is vanity, right? It's more about, you know, you can tell other lawyers, hey, I'm number one, but if you're not making any money off of it, who cares, you know? And so I think always, whenever we have discussions about any kind of KPI, is we wanna make sure that we're tying it back to the actual business and the value that we're creating for them. And so it's much better to have, you know, these kind of random keywords as long as they're driving money and making the phone ring for them. Hey, Jonathan, I can't allow, too loud. okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask a question regarding the, um, um, you know, mobile versus desktop search and just kind of your opinion. You know, now we know that, you know, mobile ranking is really based on, you know, de desktop signals, kind of what, what's been crawled. And that's what we see in uh, mobile search. Uh, in your opinion though, uh, do you think that, do you see that kind of maybe being separated, or do you see mobile and desktop merging or, or becoming more separate entities? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I would say I would say separate. Um, Apple just introduced a, a mobile-only crawler. I know Google already has its own mobile-only crawler. Um, at SMX last week, they were talking a lot about um, app indexing, and so understanding what's on you know various any of the apps that we use and res uh, returning those results uh, to users as well. And so I think that there's definitely going to be a larger parting of the two because the type of results that I want on my mobile phone are also very different than the results that I want when I'm using a desktop computer. Um, you know, in terms of Melinda and I, for instance, we were talking uh, about recipes this morning. And so if you're on your mobile phone, you just kind of want that answer box, you know, step one, two, three, four, five. Whereas if you're on a desktop, maybe you want something that has really nice photos and, you know, a little bit more commentary because you have a larger screen. And so I see the two getting farther apart, but you know, there's also a very high likelihood that there's going to be new technology that's going to you know, disrupt mobile or desktop. There's probably some unknown, unknown kind of third platform that we'll probably see in five years, right? Because even the mobile phone, um, like Apple's iPhone, less than a decade old, it's not, not that old. It's so ingrained to our life and normal to have an iPhone or to have you know, a tablet or a droid or whatever. Like this stuff didn't even exist really in 2000. I think Apple made their Newton in like nine, you know, in the 80s, but it was, or in the mid 90s, but you know, it was garbage. So yeah, I just see it kind of moving, you know, in further directions. Newton reference, so. Mm -hmm. I've got a question in from the WebEx mm -hmm. and it builds on that last question. So hasn't recent research so shown that a query has multiple touches on multiple devices? So for instance, Start with mobile, check on desktop at work, back to phone at lunch, review desktop when you get home, et cetera. I don't, was there a question in that? Um, I guess it's just more of a comment, but um, okay. have you also noticed that? Um, have you seen data that supports that idea? Oh yes, it's completely true, it's real. I mean, we all do that. Um, I don't think that's even a question. Um, and that's called cross device attribution. Um, and also cross-channel attribution. So cross-channel attribution would be if you go directly to a website, that's one channel. If we're going to our lawyer's directory project product and then moving to a website, that's another channel. If we're going through paid search, that's one channel. If we're going through local, that's another channel. And if we're organically typing it, that would be a different channel as well. Um, and so users definitely are using all of them. You know, the first time you might, and, and I think it correlates with where people are in the conversion funnel. So kind of during fact finding, you might be using one channel, might be looking for best lawyer in Minneapolis, but then when you're ready to pull the trigger, you might be putting in you know, the actual lawyer's name and, and going there. And so people are going to search and use different channels kind of depending on their goals. Um, in addition to that, there's also um, the different platforms people are using. So that's kind of cross device attribution. So that's the difference between using a mobile phone versus using a tablet or using a computer. And like for most of you guys, so say you're home watching TV, how, how many electronics, like show of by fingers, how many electronics do you normally have? I think I have three on. I have like a computer, laptop, we got some twos, threes, right? We're using a lot of different 
um, platforms to accept, uh, to understand information. And so, yes, that's completely real. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how we can get the best attribution models. And so most organizations use last click attribution. So that means the last way they got to the website before they filled out a form, that way gets all the credit. But what about the four or five different things that they looked at before you know, directly typing in the URL and clicking through, right? What about when they were doing the search on the mobile phone while they were, you know, parked in their car or looking at it in the tablet with their friend? And so there's a lot of discussion. No one really has it down yet. Google's been doing a pretty good job, but there's a lot of discussions on how we can collect better data to not only understand, you know, who's making that last click and why, but also who's assisting, you know, in basketball, right? Who's making that pass before that person makes the actual shot and understanding that better. Um, if we can do that, we're going to, like, win at the internet for like five years, but it's complicated. Hi. So we put a lot of weight into Google, which rightly so probably, but do you see the future where, or do you, do you see a future where um, things like Bing and Yahoo actually maybe start getting a larger share? And is the, I mean, the, the difference is the way they crawl and algorithm or just more algorithm? Um, crawling, I mean, there's, so across the board, there's going to be nuanced differences, but the same general idea of crawling text and then, um, you know, using an algorithm that's based on both text and link factors, that's going to be pretty consistent across all the search engines. Um, Bing and Yahoo, they'll, they'll creep up every once in a while with market share. Uh, Google has about 70% market share, plus or minus five. Um, and so that'll, that'll change and oscillate. It also um, is different based on users. And so people who are older, older than 65, generally use Bing, um, probably use AOL as well, uh, on, on dial-up with the squee uh, thing. But, um, and, and, and so I think you, know, you wanna understand first, you know, what's your target user base? If you're selling um, uh, you know, something that might be targeted at older individuals, maybe it makes more sense to put your focus on Bing because that's where they're, uh, you know, actually using the search engine. Whereas, um, you know, for, for younger people, you might find that they're not even using Google at all and that they're using social channels to discover and understand new products. So the first thing to do is kind of understand the user, and then from there you can kind of build your search strategy uh, out of that. Any other questions? Another question in from the WebEx. How will the data about mobile searching and near me searches influence the relevance of company websites like firm sites in the future? Um, in a big way. Um, so a lot of our strategy, I mean, that's why we have such a big, hey, local people. Um, that's why we have such a, a big local team, right? Is because we understand that um, the importance of local is increasing, right? 34% uh, over the last four years. And so um, our strategy needs to really be focused on making sure we're sending really quality local signals, making sure that we're making a complete Google uh, Plus profile with images and descriptions and hours and phone numbers and all that information. Um, and also making sure that that is consistent with the information that's on the firm site as well. And so uh, it's a huge impact to our overall strategy and the, you know, the teams that we have behind it as well. And it's gonna continue to change you know, as we move forward. Hi, I have a question right over here. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, going back to the products and using different social platforms, I noticed like a lot of times on Instagram, people will push out products. Have you or anyone else here, I guess, in the room, had any law firms successfully use Instagram in order to promote and not just like obviously pictures of their logos, but mm -hmm. any activities that they've done in the community? I have not seen any, um, and it's tough because Instagram is a very visual format. So, uh, what is it like? Shreds is this like protein thing, and so there's all these like very good-looking people like, talking shreds on uh, Instagram, right? But but that makes sense given the medium. Um, or you know, clothes they have huge following, so like Zara, Gap, Adidas, etc., right? Because it's, it's all images, it's stuff that you can see, it's moving sports teams, right? This is all visual stuff. Uh, law firm is not as attractive, you know, just watching people like going like this, <laughs> right? It'd be pretty boring. 
But I do think that there's still, you know, not to discount it completely, because I think there's still opportunities. Um, if you're a social justice uh, law firm, for instance, you know, taking photos of yourself at rallies and getting photographs with, you know, other people at like kind of these large, more photogenic events. Um, if you're doing something related to like political law, you know, taking photographs with like celebrities and like high um, value um, politicians could work. But I think for, you know, a lot of people, because, you know, most of their clients want to be anonymous, you don't want to be on Instagram saying, oh, I won my divorce. Um, and so I, I feel like the utility isn't as much there. But I do think for certain niches that there's still opportunity to win. It's just that you have to be really, really thoughtful about, like, who are you going for? Understanding that the user base for Instagram is generally 24 and under. And so, you know, you'd probably want to do things that are, are more more relevant to, you know, that age demo versus, you know, estate planning, right? It probably doesn't make sense because it's geared towards an older audience. But it's possible. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. We got two minutes. Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming out. Yeah. Thanks.